Hey, good morning, everyone. We're in South Texas. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Brandon. Hey, and we're in, I said South Texas, East Texas. You're not seeing any mesquite around here. And we're a couple hundred yards in your property. Gonna be a great day. Sun's out, beautiful day. I and mean, it was just frost in Missouri, so I'm out in a shirt. It's a great day for me. Uh, and we're by a little creek right here going through the property and right behind me I stopped right here is a great nice hardwood and there's there's several around I'm just gonna swing around slowly so I don't make y'all get real sick out here but there's some nice ones around and what we want to do is save these big hardwoods because you and I have had too many deer seasons to grow them again and your grandkids we got grandkids here that want to enjoy this bottom through here but there's also, I man, I don't know, a thousand plus stems per acre of stuff that's not desirable for your mission. Yes, sir. So instead of spray over this with a helicopter, which would take out these few but nice quality hardwoods, I'm going to prescribe probably a hack and squirt or a different program in here and we'll find a good forester that understands your mission. It's easy, unfortunately, for hardwoods like this to end up on the back of a logging truck and going out here while you're off working somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna find a really good forester. In this part of Texas, we've done a lot with acorn forestry, do a great job. Uh, and we're gonna walk the rest of the property, really identify what we wanna do to the species. Yes, sir. And then find a group that will help us accomplish those goals sounds great so we're early on in the day stay tuned as we start working through brandon's property here in east texas perfect okay brandon and i are going through his property this area has been logged in the past and just dog hair thick but he came in he has an emotion business say if you're in this part of texas brandon's in the motion business but he cleaned out a food plot here looks great and you may look at this i'll get down here you can see his knees what the heck are those three wires for Obviously a deer could step over that. Brandon, what you got going on here? So what we did, Grant, is last year when we did our first food plot and we planted seed, the hogs just destroyed it before anything grew. So this is an attempt to keep the hogs out of here uh, while they're growing. So we ran three uh, wires, all three are hot. We have uh, six inches, 12 inches, and 18 inches. Uh, so hopefully it won't be too intrusive for deer to jump over yeah. and keep the hogs out a little bit. Um, I hope it's successful. I like you playing a lot. I mean, you know, so we're here, and again, I'm gonna go down. I mean, we're right, my phone's on the ground, so we're right there at the ground, coming up, but it's, you know, I'm straddling the fence. It's no problem for me or a deer to step over it and i like your plan this if you put cattle panels all the way around here it'd been very expensive very expensive yes. yeah and might have excluded fawns or smaller deer yeah. and they're always a hassle but this this coming over here again you can see yeah i like your plan a lot solar powered obviously yes sir so yeah good stuff going on here brandon's got a great property we're just tooting around here doing stuff but you can see over here behind the buggy uh dog hair thick where they forested they logged and didn't replant or anything and in this part of the world privet and holly and sweet gum just take up that space instantly because folks when you clear land like this and if you didn't do anything there's a gazillion seeds out here and with the sun hitting the ground something's gonna grow yeah so another thing is brandon's gonna broadcast this soon and I just told Brandon, he was thinking about a couple of days, but let's wait till there's rain in the forecast. Yes, sir. Because those seeds are living organisms. We don't want them just laying on the ground out here baking because even right now it's cool this morning, but yeah, I can feel the warmth where that sun's hitting that darker ground and heating up. So we want to broadcast right for rain so it will germinate and grow. So Brandon and I still working on the property here and right behind us is a big old pile and, and we were just at the buggy and Brandon just told me this. This is important to know that Brandon also owns a mulching company. Your son does a lot of mulch. Yes, sir. So I want you to just tell the folks at home what you just told me. So our bright idea was to use the mulcher to create this small half acre food plot. And behind us is the remnants of what the mulcher did. And since we've mulched, we've had to bring in an excavator to pull stumps, um, clear, do, I mean, we've worked this half acre way more than we should have sure. to make it a successful food plot. So this will be the last food plot that ever gets mulched. Uh, if we do anything in 
the future it'll be with a root rake or an excavator. Yeah, because you had all that duff on top. You can't really get any seed in the ground or anything, right? Yes, yes sir. And it's rough because the mulcher's not taking out the stump, so a mulching company owner wants to sell his services. Yeah. But he's telling you, don't mulch a food plot. To prep it, nope. Yeah. Nope. Because it's just, it's just creating more work it than you need. It creates twice the amount of work. It, yeah. it opens the area up fast and it, yeah. it, it's very quick and rewarding, but to plan in it is, yeah. is not feasible. We're gonna use his mulching services in many other parts of the property, mm -hmm. but not for food plots. And yes. I wanted a mulching contractor say that because I tell people that a lot. And I don't know, it makes it so open so quick and it does, but for planting, you got all that wood debris on the ground. You can't really use a drill and disking's hard. Yeah. And you got all the stumps in there that will rot out at some time if you don't take them yeah. out. So now you got landmines all over your place. And all that mulch is gonna take all the microbes I talk about a lot that frees up the nutrients in the soil and puts in the plant. Well, they're gonna attack all that mulch and your plants are gonna look really anemic. Your first crop didn't grow that well, no, did it? No, it didn't. Because all the microbes that make nutrients available to plants are attacking all that mulch and ignoring your plants. Oh. That's what's going on. Yeah. Makes so sense. this is a great testimony. This was worth my drive down here to Texas <laughs> just to hear Brandon confirm that. That worked out well for me. So Brandon, we're just walking out and just filming a little bit about mulching, right? Yes. And we look down and that is a stump hard stump there's another one right here yeah and we actually brought the small excavator in to pull these stumps um with the anticipation of using a no-till drill this fall yeah um and this stump wasn't visible before it rained so there's plenty, and these are just leftover remnants of the, from the mulcher. And I call those landmines. We just said that yeah. right back there. Yeah. So you get a little surprise. You're going through here, and all of a sudden you hang up. Whether you're drilling or disking or whatever, mm -hmm. you just hang up on it and tear up something, right? Yeah. I bought a $3,000 uh, uh, tiller from Tractor Supply. Yeah. We went 10 foot and broke the gearbox <laughs> on that. Well, it actually was right over there. So. So yeah, and just another reason don't be mulching for food plots. Yes. It's a great tool, yeah. but not for food plot creation. Yep, absolutely. I agree. So share your observations about this, Brandon. When I designed the food plot or the, the electric fence for the hogs, um, needing three hot wires, um, the standard tape roll comes in 656 feet. And I think on this food plot, I needed a total of 3,200 feet. So I found this braided wire. Um, it seemed like it might be a little bit more durable, um, but after I set it up, there's spots where when I, when I view it from, the, from an angle, you can't see it at all. And so I'm sure an animal has a better eyesight than I do, but uh, my concern is I want the pigs to see it so they can visually be scared uh, um, once they learn it from being shot. So I think in the future, I won't use this anymore. I'll, I'll use the tape. Uh, yeah. Even if it requires me to bind them together or tie them together to create the distance that I need. I tie it together and then just take a lighter and melt it just a little bit okay. so the metal on metal's touching and not just the tape insulating around there. But the tape will actually do this a little bit, flutter in the right. wind. And that seems to spook critters also where the wire doesn't move in the wind as much. Yes, yeah. I'm not picking on Brandon. We've had a good time out here. We're still going, but... I have this great friend, Andy Andrews. If you're a reader, please go to andyandrews.com or something like that. Read his books. They're awesome. A lot of life lessons. But one of Andy's famous quotes is, it's much easier to learn from other people's experience than have to make the mistakes ourselves. Absolutely. So Brandon's a gracious guy, and he's sharing us some stuff. So if you're fencing out hogs or whatever you're doing, Brandon's telling you to tape where it's better than the little skinny wire. Seems like it to me so far. And stumps, mulching. Just hit that one again. Mulching's not the way to create a food plot. Not the way to create a food plot. Yeah. And have a plan before you get started. You would yes. agree with that, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, because we're going to redo a few things. All good. All good. And great lessons here. Hope this is helping a bunch of y'all. Brandon and I just come up to another plot he's got going here. And you can see from here, see that tape wiggling in the wind all the time? You can just see it moving a little, just slight breeze. I mean, I barely even feel the breeze but that tape is just catching and that's 
as much a deterrent, I think, all that movement, because critters don't like movement. They don't know what movement means. You know, it's anything that moves can eat them. So I think that's a big advantage of the tape over just a wire, because we can clearly see it. And it's, I mean, you look at tree, it's, you know, it's not moving. There's just enough breeze to make that wire be flicking around. So tell me what you just told me, Brandon. So you put the fence up. I put the fence up and, and electrified it. And since then, we still, we have all this corn laying out on the ground. The pigs were in here daily um, and nightly eating corn. And so obviously the fence is being effective right now. Um, it's been running about a week. Um, so there's not a week's worth of corn, so that tells me other animals have been in here. Yeah, but crows you know, and stuff are flying in. Yeah, maybe even some deer. Um, I don't have the camera set up on this feeder or in this plot still, right. but um, something's been in here eating, but if it were the pigs, there would be no corn. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I know for a fact that it is keeping the pigs out right now. And I'm not seeing any pig tracks, even though it's rained, the pigs would have d rooted enough deep enough that we'd be seeing that sign. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and no mud on the bottom to stand or the rubbing on or anything. No. So, yeah. So, your fence is working, man. I think it's working. So, hopefully, when the food plot grows, it'll keep them out of there. Yeah. Yeah. And pigs don't like electricity. That nose takes a shock right on the end of Because you ever notice a pig comes up, first thing it does, stick its nose on there and smells something. Yeah. You get, you know, a zap on the end of the nose, you learn that that's not too fun. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully, they'll learn the movement of the ribbon and associate it with the other food plots, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. I like your plan. Yeah. Good deal. All right, stop right here a second. All right, so you have several brands of blinds. Yes. Long before you met me. Uh-huh. Nothing to do with me. Nope. And you've got a redneck blind over here. Yep. Which company I like. Uh -huh. Know the owner, Dane Little. Known yep. him for over a decade. Great guy. What is your favorite blind? The redneck. Yes, yeah. and they're they're they cost more than some of the blinds you yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, they're very expensive. Yeah, but you like it. Yeah, I love it. It's it's the nicest blind I've ever seen. So originally, I wanted to build a nice stand here that was large that you know me, my wife, grandkids could all get in and hog hunt or deer hunt out of. And the intention was to for me to build a a, a large four by eight blind or something. Well, I built another one at another location, and it took me about thirty hours off and on, and it was really kind of a pain in the butt. It came out great, but after I did that, I ran across the redneck blind with the the metal stairs, and I was like, man. I, automotive quality glass everything's windows. done everything's done yeah. and it costs a little bit more but when i factor in my time it, this was well worth it and it's going <laughs> to last way longer than the one i built i you know so I, I literally work all around america i'm in texas i'm getting ready to go to maryland and ontario and georgia and alabama mm -hmm. i work all over folks daniel and i travel all the time and we see people go to Lowe's and their pickups leaving, you know, squatted down in the back and they got all the two by sixes and, you know, plywood and some of them buy a generator and a nail gun out here, you know, all this stuff, you know, and take a week off work and all this stuff. And they build a blind out of wood, even though it's treated lumber, and a few years later it's rotten out or, you know, step breaks and someone falls and yep. gets hurt or whatever. So if you're building your own blind, you're a skilled craftsman, that's awesome. But just know that wood warps would break some people could get hurt and to be honest the, the stair system and the and the and the stand yeah was what sold me on buying okay. the redneck okay and then the cherry on top was the actual blind okay you know but for longevity yeah. i couldn't have built that that would last you know to get yeah. 10 that high off the ground yeah yeah yeah. yeah 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 so and everything i'm doing out here is looking at you know what are my grandkids going to have 20 years from now you know, and so I want it to last and be there and don't go, Grandpa put that in 20 years ago. <laughs> I, so we don't, we help, a, you know, many, many dozens. I'm not going to tell everybody how many, many, many dozen landlords every year. And Brandon's just guy I found who just has a great heart. Not all the people we help do we film. Nothing wrong with them or anything like that. They don't want to. They're all just go as fast as you can. Brandon and I are having a great day out here. Uh, but man, the heart of Brandon and doing this for his family, his grandkids, and his wife. He just shared with me he hadn't shot a deer in three years because he wants to do this for his family. Mm -hmm. um, man, I love that. And I find so many hunters like that. They're great people to work with and be around the heart and just doing it for the right reason. Yeah. Yeah. I'm loving it. Today's one of those good days, folks. 
So yeah, I'm biased. I've known Danny Little for, like I said, over a decade. Great guy. A lot of people don't know the backstory of Redneck, but uh, just really briefly, Danny was a banker in a real small farming community in Missouri. And there was this company that made fiberglass playground equipment. Okay. And they went out of business overnight. And in a little bitty town, and like not only town people, but half the county farmers would have their day job, you know, building fiberglass playground equipment uh-huh. and then work on their farm after hours, weekends, whatever. Danny was a banker. And this town just left, you know, this company left town overnight. And Danny was the banker that was holding notes on a bunch of these little you know family farms whatnot yeah and he was just saw people's heart just get ripped out and he said we got to find something to put these people to work they these are great midwestern folks they know fiberglass or skilled laborers mm-hmm. but they have nothing to do and that was the birth of redneck blinds a lot wow. of people don't know that I story know that. yeah and now of course it's huge and they've got you know just really state-of-the-art manufacturing yeah. and do great quality stuff and that all started to, for a banker's heart, a little small town banker, not big, yeah. you know, family owned family mm-hmm. bank, little town bank, not some big giant bank that's, you know, jacking us all off here, just ripping us all off. But uh, the start of Redneck was to save a little Midwestern town. And that that's pretty cool. That's, uh, that's yeah. important to me. And the quality of them are unbelievable. Yeah, because yeah. you got these Midwestern farm boys and girls working to build a quality product. Mm-hmm for them to make an income, but also to help this little town. So yeah. that story's not told. And I've always told the people, I think you need to share that. So now you know the story of why there is a redneck bond. That's cool. That's cool. And I didn't it, know that. It was all about saving a little Midwestern town. We need more of that in America, folks. I, I think we need more. Absolutely.